Amen. Let us now turn to prayer before we begin our study. Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, we come before Thee this evening. We are thankful, O God, for the opportunity to gather together, to study Thy Word, to sing Thy Word back to Thee, O God. We are thankful to look to the past and to our tradition and to our heritage, O God, to learn from the faults of our forefathers, to learn from the strengths of our forefathers, and just to be gathered together here to fellowship with one another in Thy presence, O God. Lord, we are thankful for this opportunity. Lord, we thank Thee for Thy glory and for Thy wisdom and for Thy power, which is beyond comprehension, O God. We bow in humble adoration before Thy glorious throne, Thy glorious majesty. How amazing it is, not that we can only call Thee Creator, which itself would be amazing, but that we can call Thee Father, our Father even. O Lord, we are thankful for that. We are thankful for the opportunity to have a building like this to meet in, to be allowed and permitted to have a building to meet in when so many churches struggle to find places throughout the world to meet or are hunted from place to place, oh God. We do pray for our persecuted brethren throughout the world, uh, in North America, South America, all over this entire globe. Lord, we do not know every place where thy persecuted church is, but Thy eye is never away from her. Thou art always protecting her and guiding her. We pray, God, that would strengthen her, defeat her enemies, O God, either in the cross of Jesus Christ or in their removal, O Lord. Lord, we confess our sins before Thee, O Lord. We know that we are great sinners who have, this week even, since the Lord's Day, followed after our own ways. We have followed after our own desires, the desires of the flesh, O God. We have sinned and both thought and action and word and in deed, O God, and we confess our sins before Thee, looking to Thee as our, uh, as our judge and also as our merciful uh, Savior and Redeemer, O Lord. We also confess the ability and sufficiency of the cross of Thy Son, Jesus Christ, to save wretched sinners as us, O God. We look to Him alone and find our comfort, find our salvation, our all, in Him, O Lord. We are thankful for the providence of this past week, O God. We're thankful for the opportunities Thou hast given us to serve Thee, and that, Lord, we work from rest. We work from the Lord's day. We work from resting in Christ, and we are thankful for the opportunities that we were given this week to do that very thing, O God. Lord, we pray for those who are still in the hospital, recovering from surgeries, recovering from injuries, recovering from illnesses in our midst, O oh God. We pray for comfort of their body and of their soul and of their mind. Uh, Lord, we pray for wisdom to be given to the doctors in dealing with those cases. And Lord, we pray for our pregnant mothers among us, O oh God. We pray, Lord, for healthy pregnancies. We pray for safe deliveries, O oh God, and for healthy babies. We pray for all of our covenant children in this congregation, uh, both young and old. O oh Lord, those are still in the womb. We thank Thee for them. We commit them to Thy, thy care and Thy providence, O oh God. As Thou hast given them to us, so give them to Thy Son forever, O oh Lord. Lord, we are thankful for our pastor. Please watch over him as he travels, O oh God. Please bless his work and the work of the kimchi operations out there in Orlando, O oh God. Lord, be glorified and magnified in their work and give them wisdom and discernment and um, biblical values as they work through um, the things they're working on over there, O oh God. And please bring him back safely to us, O oh Lord. Well, we pray for our magistrate here in the state as elections draw near. We pray for the magistrate of our nation. O oh Lord, please raise up godly men to lead us, men who would fear thee, men who would honor thy law, men who would govern according to thy word, O oh Lord. And please cast down all wickedness in the high places, O oh God. And now, Lord, we again turn to Thee, thankful for this opportunity to gather together. Lord, please help us as we consider the past to learn from it. It's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. You may be seated. We'll be looking at Puritanism, an introduction tonight. Puritanism is uh, something that's very near and dear to my heart, something I've taught on a lot and studied a lot. Uh, throughout the years, um, and I wanted to have this opportunity, to use this opportunity to kind of give a brief introduction and overview 
I tried to make sure I'm not just quoting constantly from the Puritans, though I would love to be doing that in this, uh, in this lesson. I'm actually going to probably quote less of the Puritans tonight than I usually do in an average sermon or lesson, funny enough. But I knew that this thing would become inflated and bloated out of control if I put too many good quotes in here. But I wanted to begin with Scripture, uh, as the Puritans would do. If you would please open to two passages, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, and then keep a finger there in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, and also in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 7. Begin with 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. Hear now the word of the Lord. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Then Hebrews chapter 13, verses 7 through 9. Remember those who rule over you, who have spoken the word of God to you, whose faith follow, considering the outcome of their conduct. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Do not be carried about with various and strange doctrines. For it is good that the heart be established by grace, not with foods which have not profited those who have been occupied with them. As far as the reading of God's word, may he bless it. I begin with those two verses, those two passages, because the Puritans were above all a scriptural people. They were people who took sola scriptura, that is scripture alone, a Reformation principle very seriously in their teaching, in their lifestyle, in their practice. And then also Hebrews 13, which is a common uh, passage to turn to when you're doing biographical studies or considering historical theology, that we remember those who have come before us, who have taught the word of God to us. And as a Reformed Presbyterian church who holds the Westminster Confession of Faith, we are following and looking towards those who came before us and who have taught us in the faith, namely in the Westminster Standards, which we hold to. Now, I, I intend tonight's talk to be complementary to our Reformed spirituality studies that I've been doing in Sunday school, since much of, of what I've presented in those studies has either been drawn out of, elucidated by, applied by, supported, or illustrated by the Puritans in some regard. My, my, my engagement with a Puritan author, perhaps, or maybe I'm just drawing the outline directly from a Puritan, but I wanted to make sure that this would be a good opportunity to talk about the Puritans and talk about who the Puritans were and what Puritanism even is. The Puritans were extremely popular in their day, and they continue to be popular even today. Um, if you've listened to many popular theologians, or uh, if you've followed Ligonier's ministry, R.C. Sproul, he would quote the Puritans frequently. Uh, Joel Beakey, obviously a premier scholar of the Puritans, quotes the Puritans frequently. John Piper quotes the Puritans. I mean, it's, it's a resurgence that has happened the past 60 years of an interest in Reformed literature in general, but Puritan literature in specific, and that's something that we should thank God for. But the Puritans were enormously popular even in their own day. Henry Smith, uh, an early Puritan in the late 1500s in England, who was called the golden-tongued Chrysostom of the Puritans, uh, it was said about him that he was so popular that one um, Puritan uh, biographer said of him that persons of good repute would bring their own pews to listen to him. And by that, they meant, he meant their feet to stand upon in the aisles. That's how popular he was, that he would pack out churches wherever he was speaking. Um, it's, it's true to say that the Puritan minister was the hero of Elizabethan England. Uh, they were so popular, in fact, that in the 1640s, there was a decade, I think it's from 1640 to 1650, that 40%, 40%, of the material that was printed off of the printing press in England was repa repackaged Puritan sermons, books of Puritan sermons, 40%. Now, if you compare that to today in America, 0.001% of all the things that come off of the printing press in America are repackaged and republished sermons. So that's quite a difference. They were enormously popular in their day, and they continue to be, and I think for good reason. 
No group of authors from church history has done more for my own faith personally than the Puritans, if nothing else. I've often recalled my first exposure to the Puritans. I think I gave this story um, when I went through William Gurnall's life a few months back. Uh, I remember flipping open to his massive exposition called The Christian and Complete Armor, which is a 1,200-page exposition of Ephesians 6, 10 through 20. So just 10 verses. He wrote 1,200 pages upon it. And those are uh, tiny print double column pages. So you could really double that number. But I remember flipping open to it. I didn't really know who the Puritans were. I'd heard that word Puritan used a few times by guys I was listening to at the time, like John Piper, like Paul Washer. And um, I was in Barnes & Noble, and I saw William Gurnall's book. And it was this giant book sticking out uh, like a sore thumb in the midst of all the other books that were there on self-help, basically. And it was this massive book with a coat of arms on it. I remember flipping open and, and reading these words. Quote, first writes Gurnall, the Christian is to proclaim and prosecute an irreconcilable war against his bosom sins. Those sins which have lain nearest his heart must now be trampled upon by his feet. So, David, I have kept myself from my iniquity. Now what courage and resolution does this require? Do you think Abraham was tried to purpose when called to take his son, his son Isaac, his only son whom he loved, and offer him up with his own hands and no other? Yet what was that to this? Soul, take thy lust, thy only lust, which is the child of thy dearest love, thy Isaac, the sin which has caused thee the most joy and laughter, from which thou hast promised thyself the greatest return of pleasure or profit. As ever thou lookest to see my face with comfort, lay hands on it and offer it up. Pour out the blood of it before me. Run the sacrificing knife of mortification into the very heart of it, and this freely, joyfully, for it is no pleasing sacrifice that is offered with a countenance cast down. And do all of this now, before thou hast one more embrace from it. Truly, this is a hard chapter. Flesh and blood cannot bear this saying. Our lust will not lie so patiently on the altar as Isaac did, or as the lamb that is brought to the slaughter which was dumb, but our sin will roar and shriek, Yea, even shake and rend the heart with its hideous outcries. End quote. So that was something much different than what I was used to in a Francis Chan book or something else I was reading at the time. Not that there's anything necessarily wrong with those Francis Chan books at the time. But it was certainly in stark contrast. I didn't really know who the Puritans were or what I was even reading, but I knew it was something different. This was something far different from anything else I'd ever read or experienced. And for years afterwards, it's been my practice that whenever I come across a Puritan author, a Puritan volume, a Puritan book, online or in a book a bookshop, I buy it without asking questions. And my, uh, my wife has graciously allowed me to, to do that in my house and has now given me my own room to keep all those books in. So that's good. But she said, maybe you should research them first now, which I've tried to do. Of all the groups of writers in church history, Few have taken so seriously the words of Paul in 2 Corinthians 3, 16 and 17, which we began with, as the Puritans. They sought to bring all of Christ's words to bear on all of life and to bring all of life into subject to Christ's word. I, I hope you catch the same love that I have for the Puritans uh, and more so that we all catch some of the same love which they had for the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. If that's what we walk away with, then that's a great success. So what is Puritanism? Uh, in our day, the term Puritan or Puritanical is used as an insult. It's almost like a cuss word. Oh, you're so Puritanical, or that's just so Puritanical to think that way or to, to do those kinds of things, to have that kind of a practice is so Puritanical. When we think of the Puritans uh, in our popular mindset and 21st century America, we think of a group of dour, sour people dressed in all black, whose cold, twisted faces look like they've been weaned on a pickle, Doug Wilson says, and whose greatest concern in life, the thing that keeps them up at night, is that someone, somewhere, might be having fun. And that's what we think of Puritans in our kind of pop culture ideology, those God-hating, fun, 
fun havers must be stopped. In the minds of many, Puritan and legalist are actually synonyms. Today, Puritan or Puritanism is used as an insult still. I've had that very thing um, said against me before, where I'm talking about the Bible with someone, and they're like, well, that's just, you know, you don't have to be so puritanical about things. Oh, that I were so puritanical about things is usually my response. If I had the love that they had for Christ, if I saw the scriptures as supremely sufficient and necessary as they did, oh, that it would be so that I would be puritanical. But in fact, this, this problem with puritanism being used as a as a cuss word, as a negative thing, has been, the, has been the fact of the matter since the beginning of Puritanism. William Perkins, who is usually considered the father of English Puritanism, called the term Puritan a vile term. He says we denounce the term. We don't accept the term. It's a vile term. Much like the term Christian was first applied negatively to the followers of Jesus Christ. So too, at the beginning... Puritan was used as a, uh, as a negative term for those group of people in the beginning. It was used as an insult. It was intended to communicate that these people over here are just, uh, are, are just legalists. That's all they are. They just want to be puritanical. Now, historically, there's been much debate surrounding how we should define the word or the term Puritanism. What is Puritanism? There's been a lot of debate historically as to what we should do there. At its most basic classification, we can say that Puritanism describes that group of men from 1550 to 1662 who desired to bring the practices of the Church of England into further conformity to God's Word. That's the most basic definition of it, the most basic classification of Puritanism. That group of people from 1550 to 1662 who wanted to bring the practices of the Church of England into further conformity and reformation according to God's word. I wanted to purify the Church of England. This is historically a sound delineation. And it takes into account, certainly, the theologians, the movements, the documents, and the events that that rose up during that time, from 1550 to 1662. Well, what happened in 1662? In 1662, um, the Act of Uniformity was passed. The Act of Uniformity was put out to say all of the ministers in England have to conform to the Book of Common Prayer, the 1662 edition. And if you don't agree to have your services governed according to the Book of Common Prayer, then you are, it will be illegal for you to preach any longer. And so on that day, St. Bartholomew's Day, 1662, 2,000 um, plus Puritan ministers were ejected from their pulpits and, were, and weren't allowed within five miles of their church. So yes, we can say that that is the most narrow definition of what Puritanism is. However, tonight, I'm going to be following Dr. Joel Beakey and Dr. Mark Jones and others and think of the term Puritanism as embracing all those, not only in England, but also in Scotland, also in Ireland, also in the Americas and the Netherlands, from 1550 1550 to about mid-1700s, who imbibed the spirit of Puritanism. I think Puritans have a spirit of Puritanism. And you can even say men like Charles Spurgeon were Puritans, born out of time. Men like Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones were Puritans, born out of time. And this brings us to our next point. That's what is Puritans. Now we're at who were the Puritans. For our purposes tonight, the Puritans were those men, women, and children of God in Britain, North America, the Netherlands, who for several generations after the Reformation, and I'm following Beaky on this definition here, quote, worked to reform and purify the church and to lead people toward biblical godly living consistent with the reformed doctrines of grace. That group of people in England and Britain and North America who for several generations after the Reformation worked to reform and purify the church and to lead people toward biblical godly living consistent 
with the Reformed doctrines of grace. That's the spirit of Puritanism. That's who the Puritans were. They were those who sought to bring all of life, all of life, into conformity to the lordship of Jesus Christ, according to Jesus Christ's word. They sought to take every detail of God's word and place it upon every detail of human living and see if it was in conformity. Every detail of God's word upon every detail of human living. They took the Bible seriously. They loved the Bible. The earliest Puritans believed that the Church of England had basically not gone far enough in its work of Reformation. They looked at the Church of England, and they believed that there were still many unbiblical vestiges of Roman Catholicism left in place. They sought to remove these, not just in ecclesiastical life, but also in personal Christian daily living, the practice of piety. They wanted to see all of life, the government, the church, and average people, men, women, and children, conformed to the word of God. They did not at first desire to leave the Church of England. They wanted to purify it, to bring it into full conformity to the teaching of Scripture. They called for purity, hence Puritans. At first, remember, we said that the Puritans rejected this term. They didn't want to be called that. But then they thought about it, just like the Christians, and said, you know what, actually, that's good. We'll go with that. We are trying to purify all of life, all of church life, all of marriage, all of government, all of business, according to the word of God. We are trying to do that. According to Joel Beakey, excuse me, according to Joel Beakey, Puritanism grew out of three needs. Three needs. First, the need of biblical preaching and sound Reformed doctrine. Secondly, the need for biblical personal piety, which stressed the pure work of the Spirit of God, working upon the faith, upon the soul, and upon the life of each and every individual believer. And third, the need to restore biblical simplicity in church worship and in church government. And this need arose because of what is called uh, by historians the second generation phenomenon. The second generation phenomenon. In the first generation of the Reformation, you have guys like Luther and Calvin and Zwingli and Bullinger. <clears throat> and during that time, you have an explosion of truth. People are willing to lay down their lives and be burned at the stake for the truths that they're discovering in the Word of God. They're willing to lay their life on the line to publish the Word of God, to translate the Word of God, and to teach the Word of God. But then in the following generation, the second generation, you have kind of a cooling effect take place. The children grow up uh, taking for granted the great doctrines that were fought for in the previous generation. And so there's a kind of cooling effect that comes in in the second generation. But then after the second generation, you have the next generation, and that's the Puritans. Those children are raised with the glorious doctrines uh, that, that their fathers fought for, they take for granted. But then the next generation comes along, the Puritan generation, and says, let's go back. Let's fight again. Let's push even farther than our forefathers did. So Puritanism was in reaction to this cooling effect, of, if you will, of the second generation phenomenon. While Luther and Calvin were hammering out core essential doctrinal issues and dividing over them even, they didn't really have much time to apply them to the particulars of everyday living. The Puritans wanted to do this, though. The Puritans wanted to take these glorious truths that were hammered out in the Reformation, rediscovered, synthesized, whatever you want to say, and then apply it to all of life. They wished to bring the doctrines of the Reformation, the teaching of Holy Scripture, to bear on every aspect of human life. They wanted to ask questions and find scriptural answers for questions like, how does one live as a godly husband? How does one live as a godly wife, a daughter, a son, in light of our union to Christ, in light of Christ's sacrifice for us, our adoption in him? This was the program of the Puritans. They wanted to say, let's not stop short of full submission to Christ in all things. Let's go all the way. 
He deserves our all. Let us not take uh, for granted the glorious truths that are in God's word, that he has revealed to us in his providence and in his kindness. Let's take up the mantle of our fathers and, in fact, go further than they did. Go further than they did. So the Puritans were those who loved the truth of Scripture and wished to bring glory and honor to Christ in all of life. Whether that's the prayer closet, the home, the home economy, the father, the mother, the children, whether it was the business, how we conduct business as Christians, the government, how the government should be interacted with by Christians and by the church, how those who are Christian but who are also in government should act and should behave, and what they should do, and in the church, how the church should function. All things brought into subjection to Christ's word. That was their goal. So while Puritanism first began as a movement within the Church of England, the spirit of Puritanism was by no means restricted to just those men in the Church of England. It's important, <clears throat> excuse me, it's important to mention also that the Puritans were not monolithic. I mean, there's not just one Puritanism. They're not monolithic, nor did they exist or come to be in a vacuum. They built upon the work of those who came before them. Not just the Reformers, but the Church Catholic. Uh, many of the Puritans, if you read their writings, they're going to be quoting from all of the Church Fathers. They're going to be quoting from Plato and Aristotle, even. They're going to be quoting from the Medieval Church Fathers. They are building upon the work of the church. They're building upon the work of the Spirit of God working in and through his people in all ages. They weren't coming to hew out a new cistern of their own, but they were building upon the work of those who came before them. Within what we could consider the Puritans, you had those who wished to remain in the Church of England. They just wanted to see the Church of England purified. They wanted to see it reformed, but they didn't want to leave the Church of England. And were even willing to conform to the Church of England in 1662 when the Act of Uniformity was put out. Guys like William Gurnall, who I've, taught, who I've taught on before. Guys like Edward Reynolds. And Edward Reynolds was one of the chief architects of Westminster theology. And then, when the <clears throat> Act of Uniformity came about, he conformed to the Church of England and became a bishop. So you have a vast array of views within Puritanism. It's not monolithic. You also had those who wished to separate from the church entirely and remain independent, that is the, the English church. You had congregationalists like John Owen, like William Bridge, like Thomas Goodwin. Then you also had particular Baptists who would also be congregationalists like Benjamin Keach, Nehemiah Cox, and John Bunyan. You also had those who wished to separate and form a more biblical ecclesiastical system like the Presbyterians. So you have Thomas Manton, Joseph Carroll, Jeremiah Burroughs, and many others. The point to remember is that the Puritans are not monolithic. When, we, when I say the Puritans, when you say the Puritans, you hear other people talking about the Puritans, it can often sound like it's some monolithic movement wherein everybody agreed inside that movement, and that's not the case at all. There was a wide array of views within what we could call Puritanism. There's Baptists. Uh, there's also what you could call small p, little p Puritans, like the Scottish Presbyterians, Samuel Rutherford, David Dixon, James Durham, as well as those who separated totally, uh, even physically, and moved to the New World, to New England, like Thomas Shepard, Cotton Mather, Samuel Withard, uh, Willard, and one born out of time, Jonathan Edwards. <clears throat> the point to get across is that even within this class that we call Puritan, Puritanism, you have many differing views, many different views. You have men like John Bunyan who are Baptists. Richard Baxter, who a lot of people would have problem even calling Reformed. George Gillespie, a staunch Scottish Presbyterian if there ever was one. And then men like Edward Reynolds, who after being one of the chief proponents of Westminster Presbyterianism, then conforms to the Church of England. And many of his brothers looked at him with great suspicion. He was not very popular with his Presbyterian brothers after that. 
The point is that Puritanism captures a spirit, a spirit of those who wish to live unto God, who see their chief end as glorifying God and enjoying Him forever. This, this spirit, this spirit of Puritanism, can be seen all throughout the Reformed Golden Age in England, Ireland, Scotland, America, and the Netherlands. The Puritans had many faults. It's important to recognize that as well. As much as I'm hyping them up right now, the Puritans had many faults. They had many blind spots, many areas that needed improvement. But they captured a spirit of living all of life quorum Deo, that is, before the face of God, soli Deo Gloria, to the glory of God alone. This is who the Puritans are, but we still must ask, why the Puritans? Why would I get up here <clears throat> and tell you about the Puritans? Why should you invest time and money reading the Puritans? What's the point? Well, why the Puritans? Well, I, had, I could give you like 70 reasons, but I've narrowed it down for you, thankfully. What can we get from the Puritans that we cannot find elsewhere? That's a good question. What can we get from the Puritans that we can't find somewhere else? And I want to stress and emphasize that it's not so much that we won't find these things anywhere else, or else I don't think that's a very good movement at all. If the first time these things are being said is in the 1600s, well, I don't want a Christianity that began in the 1600s, right? So it's not that we can't find this stuff anywhere else in modern authors or other ancient authors, but I do think it's true that we certainly will not find the, the specific benefits that we find in Puritan authors in such a concentrated dose, nor put so clearly, concisely, or beautifully as we find in the Puritans. A few particular areas of profit that the Puritans provide, in my opinion. First, Puritan writings help us shape life by Scripture. They help us shape life by Scripture. Above all else, the Puritans were people of the book. People of the book. They loved, lived, and breathed holy scripture. A typical page of a Puritan work glitters with citations of scripture, quotations of scripture, and allusions to scripture all over the page. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about this in our Reformed Spirituality class when we get to the discipline, the spiritual discipline of uh, reading good, godly, edifying literature. But you can take the Puritans in your daily devotions and read one page and look up every Bible verse and pray over each Bible verse and meditate upon each Bible verse and test the doctrine that the guy is teaching you based upon the scriptures. And you can spend time in God's word almost like nothing else you'd ever come across. It's not true of every Puritan author, but most of the Puritan authors, you open up a page of typical Puritan writing, it's covered in scripture. These people were people of the book. They were just as comfortable in Haggai and Obadiah as they were in the book of Romans or the Gospel of John. The vast majority of Puritan books today, if, if you see my shelves or Pastor Joel has a, a bunch of sets on his shelf as well, of these Puritan tomes, these Puritan works, what it is primarily is repackaged sermons. Repackaged sermons. These people lived the Bible. They preached the Bible. They loved the Bible. Their writings stress upon us the sufficiency of Scripture for all of life and godliness. Secondly, the Puritans show us how to integrate biblical doctrine into daily life. This was probably where they shine the, the brightest, I think. They weren't ivory tower theologians. These were people who, the ministers, the Puritan ministers were men who were amongst their people day in and day out, and they wanted to speak to the people the word of God in a way they could understand, a way that could grip their hearts, a way they could sink into their ears and then into their minds, a way they could remember. Joel Beakey talks about, <clears throat> excuse me, Joel Beakey go, talks about when he goes to uh, buy uh, antiquitarian books when he's looking for Puritan literature. That he will go to these, these bookshops in uh, England and he'll, he'll, from across the room, he can tell if he sees an old set of books, if it's a Puritan or if it's an Anglican. 
the way you can tell is that the Anglican book, no one's ever read it. It's in pristine condition. No one read their sermons. But the Puritan books, he says, when he sees a, a book across the room that's falling apart, it doesn't have a cover, its binding is bent, he goes, ah, it's a Puritan book, I know it. He says about nine out of ten times he's right. Because people read these books. They loved these books. They spoke to the people. They brought deep doctrine into, the, uh, into a way that was understandable for people. They weren't ivory tower theologians. They wanted to know not just the, the substitutionary atonement of Christ, but what does that have to do for me as a businessman, as a shop owner, as a merchant, as a mother, as a father, as a husband, as a wife. For one example I could give you of th- their delight in bringing all of Scripture to bear on all of life is in <clears throat> William Googe, a famous Puritan. Uh, he has a book called Domestical Duties. It's been republished by Reformation Heritage Books, lightly abridged and lightly updated in three volumes now. I think it's called Building a Godly Home. But it's a 600-page massive book on marriage. And he has 10 pages and I think 12 points on why women should nurse their babies. All drawn from Scripture. Scripture. All, all applying scripture to that premise. These people wanted to bring all of scripture to bear on all of life. The Puritans, number three, show us how to exalt Christ in his beauty. The Puritans see Christ everywhere. If you begin reading the Puritans, you'll notice this right away. Sometimes they see Jesus possibly where he's not in Old Testament passages, but I'd prefer a guy who sees Jesus where he isn't than somebody who misses him where he is. They see Christ everywhere. And they show us how to exalt Christ and his beauty from all of Scripture. Thomas Adams, the great Puritan, wrote this, quote, Christ is the sum of the whole Bible, prophesied, typified, prefigured, exhibited, demonstrated, to be found in every leaf, almost in every line, the Scriptures being, but as it were, the swaddling bands of the child Jesus, end quote. That's the view they had of Scripture. It's the swaddling bands of the child Jesus. He's on every page. He's the sum and substance of the whole. He is the main point of every story and the great story. They loved Christ. They cherished Christ. And their goal in preaching and in writing was to have their hearers and to have their readers Cherish Christ, too. Some of the most beautiful things that could ever be read on the topic of the person and work of Jesus Christ can be found in the writings of the Puritans. Uh, One example which comes to mind is John Flavel. He has a book in volume one of his collected works called The Fountain of Life Opened, and it deals with a threefold office of Jesus Christ as mediator, as prophet, priest, and king. It's one of the most amazing, most beautiful, moving things you could ever read or found in there. In other words, the Puritans show us how to delight in Christ, to exalt in his beauty from all of Scripture, in all of life. Four, <clears throat> the Puritans show us how to handle trials in our lives well. Few groups of, of people in church history endured more trials, endured more hardships than the Puritans. Puritanism, you recall, grew out of a struggle between God's word and the opponents of God's word. The average Puritan minister spent at least a year in prison. The average Puritan minister spent at least a year in prison at some point. Uh, Some of the other ones often much longer. The average Puritan family, this isn't just a minister, but the average Puritan family had eight to nine children, and they lost four or five of them, before adulthood. They knew what it was to endure hardship as a good soldier for Jesus Christ, 2 Timothy 2.3. And when their historical circumstances are brought to remembrance, there's the English Civil War, there's persecution, the Covenanters are, are persecuted heavily in Scotland. You have persecution from within the church and from without the church. Christians persecuting Christians, Evil governments persecuting Christians at this time. And when you think about what's going on in that time, there's fires. All of London is burnt down. There's droughts. 
there's plagues. It's truly amazing that they can write the beautiful things they do about Jesus Christ and about God's fatherly providence in the midst of those things. Or actually, is it amazing at all? Is that not how they saw how beautiful Christ was? Is that not how they saw the loving uh, hand of their father and the providences he gave them, even the difficult crosses they laid upon their back? Fifthly, the Puritans show us how to live by holistic faith. How to live by holistic faith. The Puritans constantly apply every subject that they touch on in their writings to its particular uses. You'll often have the passage explained, an exegetical argument explaining the passage that they're touching upon, and then they'll draw out the doctrine that it teaches, and then from that doctrine they'll have uses or applications. What do I do with this doctrine? How do I use it? And they'll have sometimes as many as five, six, or ten uses for every doctrine they draw out of a text. And they do this to spur believers on towards passionate and effective use within Christ's kingdom. The Puritans had, had no idea, they couldn't even begin to, uh, to understand how we think today of this dichotomy between secular and spiritual, of sacred and secular. They would have no, uh, no understanding of that whatsoever. They saw all things as Christ's. All things were under the lordship of Jesus Christ. And we, as Christians, interact with Christ's world. And Christ is Lord over all of it. And Christ is Lord over all the actions of the people on this earth. And Christ governs all that we do. And Christ's law governs all that we do. They would have, they would have no understanding uh, of, you know, you hear people talk about, maybe they don't outwardly say this, but we, we can recognize that we do this sometimes. We say, here's my church life over here. Here's my private devotional life. <clears throat> here's my family life. Here's my work life. Here's my social life. And I don't really mix these things. No, you're a Christian in all of these things, they would say. You're a Christian in all of these things. And Christ is Lord in all of your life, no matter what it is you are doing. These things can't be separated. There is no such thing as secular and sacred for the Puritans. There is no sa secular government and, and, and sacred living. It's all one thing for them. Christ is Lord. And that's what they pressed upon us. That's what they're useful it's helpful to get a full-orbed biblical worldview from the, Purit from the Puritans. All of life was to be lived in faith to Christ. While there are many more points that, that can be given, uh, time fails us, and I, I, I fear my voice will as well. <clears throat> Let's move on to number four. In application, using the Puritans, okay? Great. Maybe I've convinced a couple of you that the Puritans are something to look into. How do we, what's the right way to use the Puritans? The Puritans are not the end-all, be-all of Christianity. I have to tell myself that. The Puritans are not the end-all, be-all of Christianity. I believe the Puritan age, I really do, was a true golden age of revival, of piety, of theology, of cultural engagement, of Christ pouring out his spirit upon men. <clears throat> but as any movement, the Puritans had their blind spots. They had their faults, and we should learn from their gifts as well as their faults. As a group of authors, few will aid the average Christian more in terms of developing a holistic, Christ-centered, biblically Bible-saturated worldview. Few authors will stir your heart to love the Savior more or bring the truths of God's word home to our bosoms or our businesses more than the Puritans. That's a quote from one of the Puritans, actually. That in preaching, he said, I forget who it was. <clears throat> he said, in preaching, the goal of the preacher is to bring God's word home to the businesses and bosoms of God's people, to their hearts and then their daily lives. While the Puritans were not legalists, some of the Puritans were often too given to morbid self-introspection. That must be noted, I think. <clears throat> As you read some Puritans, some of them can go on and on and on about true repentance. And they'll have pages upon pages of what true repentance looks like, 
how sinful you are. And sometimes that can get excessive. And we must be weary going into that and, and keep our guard on of, of, of not just falling into uh, morbid self-introspection and looking to ourselves rather than looking to Christ. However, I will give this caveat as well. I don't think that's true of most Puritans. They don't usually fall into that. And secondly, it's, it, it says more about how we read as modern readers. Because their sermons could last two hours, and people had no problem sitting through that. So we could be reading for five pages, and you're only in you know, 10 minutes of their sermon. And you're like, wow, I've been getting hit for the last 30 minutes about how sinful I am, and I'm just... I'm at my wit's end now. Uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm despairing. Well, for them, that was only 10 minutes of the sermon. And their whole goal in, in doing that and, and showing you, here's what true repentance looks like. Here's what true faithfulness looks like. Here's how sinful sin is, is that they then turn around and point you to Christ, always. So it, it, it might be a mixture of, of, of our own inability to read well in our own circumstances today. At times, some of the Puritans were far too intolerant of other positions. That's also true. Some saw very few things in life and in Christianity as indifferent. Everything was a primary issue. Therefore, nothing was a primary issue, really, at the end of the day. But some Puritans erred on this. They thought everything was a primary issue. They cast suspicion on anyone who would disagree with them on anything. One example I can think of is... Samuel Rutherford, who I love Samuel Rutherford. If you ever read his letters, they're they're phenomenal reading. But Rutherford condemned Richard Baxter before he had even read Richard Baxter. In a book, he wrote a book against Richard Baxter and Richard Baxter's theology before he'd even read a single word of Richard Baxter. And he says that in the intro. You know, I've never read the guy, but here's what he believes and here's why he's wrong. So because Richard Baxter wasn't part of his party, wasn't part of his sect, wasn't part of his denomination, wasn't part of his tribe, he had suspicion upon Richard Baxter. Now Richard Baxter had some issues, but it's not becoming of a Christian to write a book against the errors of someone that you've never even read. So sometimes the Puritans could be too intolerant towards other Christians. Another fault of the Puritans was a multiplying of rules that are not found in God's word. They could do this sometimes. They could err on trying to elucidate God's word. They end up making it muddy, actually. And a lot, of, a lot of times this had to do with their own historical situations or disputes which were happening at the time. <coughs> Last point. Building upon the Puritans. Building upon the Puritans. Okay, where do you go from there? We recognize that they have some faults, but I want to point us towards where do we go from there? How do we use the Puritans rightly? Well, we should build upon what the Puritans have done, and we, and we have been for hundreds of years. The church did not begin, nor did it end with the Puritans. I have friends whose appreciation of the Puritans uh, has almost erred into idolatry, in my opinion. If the Puritans addressed it, that's the final word on it. Well, whatever particular group of Puritans they like. If the Puritans didn't address it, it's not useful to us. They don't wish to move beyond the Puritans. The Puritans are the end-all, be-all of everything. If their favorite Puritan said it, then it's law forever. If their Puritans didn't address it, there's no need for us to talk about it. But it's important to remember, so we don't end up idolizing these men, that they were just men like you and I. They were just people whose families got sick, whose spouses died. They had to take out the trash They had to open up the shop in the morning. They had to harvest crops. They had to open their stores in the morning. They had to clean the house. Their car didn't break down on the way to work, but their horse broke its leg sometimes on the way to work. They're regular people just like you and I. God did an amazing thing during those couple hundred years. True. But Christ is still active and working amongst his church. We must build upon what they did. If we just enshrine ourselves in the past, we'll never be able to make any progress. As my professor, Dr. Beakey, told us in our Prolegomena course, each generation of God's people must speak the same truths of God's word, not inventing new things, but speak the same truths of God's word afresh to each generation. 
There's still more work to be done. We can't do this, again, if we are enshrined in the past. We don't wish to move beyond the Westminster divines. The Puritans help us speak God's word faithfully to this generation, just as they did to their own. We're not speaking to their generation. I've had to remind some of my <clears throat> friends who I think err too far on this, of just being obsessed with the Puritans, said, listen, we're not in 1664 anymore. We're not in 1648. This is 2022 in America. We've got cars. We've got a, a, a publishing outlet in my pocket at all times. It's glowing. They would be blown away by what we have, right? We have to speak God's word fresh to each generation. The same truths, but fresh. Again, the Puritans were building off of Calvin. Some have tried to pit Calvin and the Calvinists against one another. That was a popular thing in the 80s for theologians to do. But I don't think there's any discrepancy between the Westminster Confession, Westminster Standards, and Calvin's teaching. However, they clearly expanded upon what Calvin was teaching. And so, too, we can expand upon what the Westminster divines taught. I, don't, I hold to the Westminster standards entirely. I don't think there's any uh, errors in there that, I, that I've found. But the final authority is Scripture, isn't it? The final authority is Scripture, not confessions. The final authority is Scripture, not tradition. We can learn from our tradition. But if we elevate our tradition, if we elevate the Puritans or any group of theologians that we love or like above Scripture, then we'll be stuck. We'll be enshrined in that time. The Puritans developed the doctrines they received. We must develop the doctrines that we have received from them in the Westminster Standards. <clears throat> Lastly, I want to give you a few places of where to begin. You want to read Puritan literature, get an introduction to the Puritans. Here's a few things that I think would be good. I can also... Uh, have a written edition of this as well that I'll hand out not this week because I'll be in Payson but the week after during Reformed Spirituality I'm going to give a reading list and I'll give these as well but a good introduction to the Puritans first and foremost just type in on YouTube or Google or whatever Joel Beakey Dr. Joel Beakey on the Puritans his teaching and on the Puritans is, is phenomenal same for Mark Jones as well but if you want a book um, it's a really simple, small book. What is this? 100 and 151 pages, really short chapters. It's called Following God Fully, an Introduction to the Puritans by Joel R. Beakey and Michael Reeves. If any of you have the Canon Plus app, which I know some of you do, this is actually, uh, they have an audio version of this you could just listen to. So Following God Fully, an Introduction to the Puritans by Beakey. Then you have something like Meet the Puritans by... Joel Beakey and Randall Peterson, and it basically just goes through uh, giving little miniature biographies of all the Puritans, the major Puritans, and then a guide to their works, you know, what, what books they wrote, where you can buy those books today, etc. But another great place to start if you don't, uh, if you want to get started actually reading the Puritans are little quote books, little quote, quote books like this, uh, a Puritan golden treasury of quotes from the Puritans. This is a great place to just get a taste of what the Puritans are like. Then you also have basically any of the Puritan paperbacks. You're going to have some of the classic Puritan works, uh, either lightly abridged or updated in some way. For instance, here's The Mortification of Sin by John Owen. Basically, any of the Puritan paperbacks are going to give you a great intro to Puritanism. All right, I fear that is it for my voice this evening. Let us pray. Lord God Almighty, we are thankful for thy grace. We're thankful for thy mercy. Thankful for thy care of us, O God. Lord, help us to learn from the past, whether it's the Puritans or the Church Fathers or any of the men who have come before us, from the history of the OPC and Machen and all those other great men. Help us to learn from them and to build upon what they have done, but help us never to elevate the heroes of our faith above Christ or above thy word, O Lord. Help us to be in submission to thy word. Lord, we thank thee for this time together. 
We ask, O Lord, for thy blessing upon us. Help us to get home safely. Watch over us and watch over our pastor as he works and bring him home safely to us. It's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen.